All right, it's machine learning time. Um, and today is absolutely a stretching day. I don't know about you guys, but it kind of is uh, not great outside. I'm, I'm going for it. And, and you are required to, or not, you know, whatever. Yeah, I will, I will fail anyone that I don't see stretching right now. <laughs> oh. All right, OK, cool. So you know I was saying that we were doing sort of the hard part first, and then we're going to get start to get into the, the more fun stuff? Now's the time. Um, so we're going to be doing convolutions today, which are very important. And we're starting with vision, uh, vision tasks, which means that we're going to get to do some homeworks where we get to look at stuff, which we really like. So first, I'm going to start off with some just miscellaneous stuff that was on my mind. First up, homework one is graded. Um, I don't know if many people saw this. Uh, feel free to put in a regrade request. My T TA isn't here to object. Uh, abuse that. Definitely <laughs> if, if look through it and make sure that everything makes sense. Cool. Uh, two, the teaching award nominations close tonight. Um, and I recommend, because I looked at the actual nominations, and basically no one nominated anyone, which I think is a little bit sad. Um, so if there's a teacher that you enjoyed uh, previously, then I would say go show them an award. You know, People in the department really care about this stuff. And they will look at teachers who get this award and say that students really love them. So if someone you don't like gets it, maybe the department won't do what you want. Secondly, I am not shilling for myself. It turns out, in fact, you cannot even nominate me. So you can't even do that. Um, and that's the email. Just email them and write a little letter about someone if you want to. I know homework's due tonight, but if you already finish it or if you don't care about your grade, you can definitely do it. Cool. Um, thirdly, today is February 22nd, 2022. It's also a Tuesday. I just thought that was, that was cool. And homework two is due today. <laughs> Full circle. That's Thank you. It is. And it is time for the fun stuff. Um, I will say, I have been working on homework three for the past two days. Um, and I think, I think I've been able to incorporate the feedback. <laughs> and I also think it'll be pretty interesting. We get to do the fun stuff now, and we get to also use an autograd, which means no more math. Woohoo. Actually, a tiny bit of math, but now it's, uh, it's going to be algebra. We'll see. Not linear algebra, just straight up addition and subtraction. We'll see if you guys can handle it. Today's lecture is going to cover that. Cool. So we're starting vision stuff. And let's start with my good friend. MNIST. So you may have heard of this data set. You may have not. But it is an important one, and it's a famous one. And we're going to learn about it real quick. So it is 28 by 28 pixel images of handwritten digits. So you can see them right there. Ooh, they're black and white, 28 by 28. What we care about is looking at these images, which are just a collection of pixels, and saying what number they are. Easy enough for us. Look at that. That's a 5. Cool. But it's pretty hard for us to like, combine those things. There's a few differences between what we've done before. And there are a few new techniques we could use now that we have images. Images have particular properties. So let's try just using, this is some MLP. And let's see what we might want to do. So we have the image, and it's going to have 784 inputs. And it's going to go through the network. And what might we want the output to look like? So this is just the same model that I've had this whole time. but you know, we can, we can decide right now, what sort of output do we want for this? Yeah. 10 different values, 0 through 9. 10 different values, 0 through 9. That seems reasonable, since there are 10 classes. Why wouldn't we just have a single output and have it be the number? Any reason for that? Give it, give it, give it a little think. Give it a, give it a minute. Yeah. And you can talk to people with you. All right, see what they think. OK, any, anyone have any thoughts? I know that was really quick, but anyone have any thoughts? <laughs> People aren't done discussing yet. I'm sorry, I'm moving quick today. Yeah. 
Hey, I'm, I'm, I, I ended the time a little bit quick. Uh, I'm sorry. I know there's a lot to discuss here, but we'll discuss it all together. So what's your thought? Yeah, so this is an advantage of us having it like this, is that we can, and I'll show right here, we can have each one of these represent a probability. OK, that's a very nice sort of idea. We can say, OK, we have probabilities as our output now. Woohoo! And we are going to do that, absolutely. But it still doesn't take away the idea of why can't we just have a single output that is a single number. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. So that is true. And if, as long as we're not combining the losses with something like mean squared error or something like that, that is an actual property where if we are training multiple tasks at the same time, we can say that each time we feed in an image, like this image of an 8, we're saying we're training the network to say yes to 8 and no to everything else at the same time. And having sort of multimodal training like this, where we have multiple different outputs, actually has been shown to improve the generalization of the learning. So that is true. But there is a more fundamental reason why not that this is good, but why the other solution is bad. And we shouldn't have a single output. How about this? What would it mean to our model if we had a single output and it output 2.5? It would mean that it is somewhere halfway between 2 and 3. Why on earth are 2 and 3 similar? They aren't. They just are numerically. They're not visually. They're not, I mean, they might be fairly visually, but by having a single output where we have these different classes represented as actual numbers and we're doing regression on them, we're insinuating that the classes that have similar numbers are more alike than other ones. So if we output a 2.5 and the actual output is a 3, then we say, good, we did great. Or if it's a 2, um, and we output a 3, we say, OK, that's not that bad, even though that is completely wrong. So we don't want to have a single output for that reason. It will confuse the network also, because it's trying to learn to get close to certain numbers that are related just numerically. So we don't want that. And this will end up working a lot better. So we're going to treat these like probabilities. And the way that we're going to do this is we're going to Hand wave introduce. I'm not going to ask you guys to actually use this in the homework or uh, anything like that. We're going to introduce the idea of soft max. So it might be reasonable that we have some output, some 10 outputs, right? And we have no control over their scale, right? They could be a million. They could be 0 0.00001, right? But they will have some relationship. One will be the highest, for example. So it might be reasonable for us to say our prediction is whatever one of them is the max. Right? If the one node, the very first node, or the second node in this case, is the highest number, when we say it is predicting one. The problem with that is that max is not a differentiable equation. So we can't, we can't take the derivative of a maximization. That doesn't really mean anything. So we introduce what we call a soft max, which is a differentiable version of max. Essentially, it's the ex uh, exponential of each of the terms over the summed exponential of all of the terms. You can convince yourself of why that ends up being very close to maximum on your own time, but just know that we can do that. Right? And you'll notice also that if we do that, they'll sum up to 1. So we can treat them like probabilities, which we like to. This process is called logistic regression. What's very ironic about this is that we're doing classification, and we're calling it logistic regression. Just keep that in mind in case that, that ever catches you off guard. But the uh, logit is what we're doing here, where we are treating them as a probability on the output. Cool. And this process is allowing us to bridge the gap between the two. So now we have essentially a, regress a regression problem on each of these, where we have some particular number, a probability. And we're comparing it to now the classes, which we are just going to treat as whichever the true classes, in this case 8, we will say should have had 100% probability and everything else should have had a 0% probability. And that allows us to use our normal loss functions on this. So let's take a look at that. In this case, so actually I, I, I kept a, OK. So in this case, you can see it should have output a 100% for 8 and 0 for everything else, right? 
So normally we'd actually want a sign here, but I, I did not include the sign. Um, this is just the straight up difference between them. So this would be mean absolute error in this case. Um, generally, we want to keep the sign because we'd like the eight to increase and we like everything else to decrease, right? So in this example, just for example, to remind us of, of our loss functions, the MAE would be that and the MSE would be that. So we can definitely calculate those two values. Cool. So now we get to the idea of we're using an MLP and we've seen that we can do stuff with it, right? We can classify these images. And I'll just tell you that we can. And we actually do pretty well on it. But we have images now. And images are not just random data. They're not features that we have no idea of the relationship. There's a relationship right there. We can see it. These pixels are next to those pixels, whatever. So is there some way that we can use the more complex features? I'm still going to call them features, but more complex attributes of the images to do the classification rather than just the pixel values. Um, yes, we can. <laughs> and that's the whole point of this, this presentation, all that. Uh, there are many ways we can do this. Uh, the overarching concept is called feature extraction, where we're taking something and we're extracting useful features from it. There are a lot of techniques to do it. We're going to talk about some more in the future, but today we're going to talk about one of the most popular ones, and one that is very particular to images. It is usable in other situations, but we're going to talk about it in regards to this. So I want you guys to think, about what some of these things, like in the case of MNIST, right? we have all these handwritten digits. What might be some useful things for us to be able to use instead of just the pixel values? This time, we're going to actually take a little bit of time and talk in your groups, like three to five minutes, all right? Give it a go. All right, all right. Time to stop talking or working on homework too if you're doing that. Um, and oh, where's my clicker? There it is. So, um, what are people thinking, right? And I, I told one group over there, and it might be a good way to think of it. One thing that you can think of as very important features is imagine if we blocked out half the image. If we just took half the image and we covered it up, then what might we still be able to use to identify the number? 
we think, and this is actually a, a, a real concept in ML, is what features are the most important uh, is related to the ones that are still able to classify the best, even if we cover up a whole bunch of the rest of the image. And it's a real thing that we can actually calculate. Um, but regardless of that, what do people think? Any ideas? Back there? I, oh, I, you put it down. All right, sorry. Sure. Do you want to finish it? Uh, I mean, no line, like vertical line, horizontal line, uh, loop in the upper part, in the lower part. So that is certainly a good idea. So if we look at like eights and sixes, right? They both have loops, right? And we care about one if there is a loop, and two, where is the loop? And just by using simple heuristics like that, we could probably construct a fairly good classifier. If we just said, look for loops, and look for two loops that are next to each other, and that's probably an eight, and we just did it like that. Cool, but that doesn't really help us too much with machine learning, but maybe we could automatically learn those things. And that's where we're going with all of this. So. We're going to talk about convolutions. So convolutions are a very useful thing. And the real punchline to all of this is that pixels that are nearby each other can form shapes and useful features that are better for identification than just the pixel values themselves. So let's say we have some image. I made it binary to make the math easy on you guys. So you have ones and zeros. Cool. What we're going to do is we're going to introduce the idea of a kernel. You can think of this as uh, what is most naturally thought of as a filter. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this filter and we're going to overlay it over the image at different positions and then multiply all of the corresponding values. So in this case, the upper left one with the upper left one and then the one to the right with the one to the right and so on. I'll show you an animation in a minute. It'll make it very clear. We're going to summation, and in this case, you know, like I just said, we have the 1 times the 1 plus the 0 times the, z times the 1, 1 times 1, so on, so on, so on, and we end up getting the value 4. So out of this, we get the value 4. And what we're going to do is we're going to take that value and stick it into an output array. All right? So that will now correspond to the kernel being overlaid in the upper left corner. All right. So now... I want you to ask the question, what will this value be? And to give you a little bit of help as to like, how we would decide what the next value is, we're going to move the kernel over one place to the right and do the same process. And that will be the value in the next cell. So give it, give it some time to think. Three, I'm hearing, hearing lots of threes. That's good because the answer is three. Um, so you got the basic idea, like I told you, just algebra. This is the first little bit of algebra that we're doing. So here's the animation now, and you can see we lay it over. We're going to move over one step at a time and take every single one of those. So one thing I want you to notice is we started with an image that's pretty big, and we got an image that's smaller. That is interesting because we are reducing the size of the problem. So imagine if we had this new output, and then we fed that into a neural network or something like that we would end up now having a smaller neural network. This is an interesting idea because it allows us to reduce the size of the problem. It's not necessarily how convolutions are used always, but it's interesting to think about. And something we're going to talk quite a bit about right now. So we have the image and we have the kernel. Now we are going to introduce a whole bunch of new hyperparameters because convolutions have quite a few of them. And we are going to think about how they all relate. So first up is stride. So in the first example, we moved over one each time. Now we're going to be able to move over however many we want. And that is going to be the stride. So if our stride is two, then we take the first, and then we move over two, and then we take the next. This is going to change the, out, the output size, you might realize. Um, it will also change the behavior. Now one thing to note here, and this is not always clear to people who are new to convolutions, is that this kernel is called a kernel, but you can think of it as a filter is made entirely of parameters. So we are going to be updating the values of this kernel. And we're going to be doing it with gradient descent. So 
let's look at what these might look like after we do some training. All right? They look pretty interesting. So this is trained on a color data set, which is why all, the, uh, all these images are colored. But you notice some interesting things about this. So this is going through multiple levels of convolution. We start with this first convolutional layer, and it will extract some features. Then we take that, and we feed it through another convolutional layer, which is just one of those filters, or many of those filters. And we do it again, and we get now what this calls low-level, mid-level, and high-level features. You can think of that how you want. But what do we notice about these? Is there anything of note about the first, the low-level features? Yeah. They're more similar to each other. That's an interesting observation. They are. Anything else? Yeah. They're less detailed. In particular, they are just here, really, colors and very simple shapes. In, in this case, lines, vertical, horizontal, and everything in between. It's interesting to note also that there are experiments that were done on cats <laughs> where they tested when certain neurons in the V1 part of our cortex, of a cat's cortex, were firing. And they found that there were different uh, what are called cortical columns that would fire for di different orientations of lines moving back and forth. So if you moved it this way, one cortical column would fire. You move it this way, a different one would. And it's interesting to see that the convolution does sort of mimic those most important features, or at least those low-level features. And those, very similarly, were measured in the V1 of our vision cortex, which is, or of the cat's vision cortex, which is the first layer. So then it has multiple layers. And through that sort of thinking, we have come to the conclusion, or some people have come to the conclusion, that this property of convolution is mirroring actual vision that is taking place in animals. You'll also notice that if we look at the higher level features, they become more abstract and much more different than each other. You see later on here, this is a vision set that is trained on cars. You notice there is what looks like wheels, and there seem to be these strange sorts of patterns. Interesting. So, what does it look like for us to actually use these? You know, it's all well and good to say this is what it looks like pretty pictures. Let's talk about using them. So, first up, the main way that they're used, sort of you might have been able to insinuate this by the way I'm talking about it, is as feature extraction. So we will have them before the rest of our neural network. We usually use them in tandem with other neural networks. It's not necessary, but usually we do. And then we go through a feed forward layer, so, or a feed forward network. So this would be, we do our convolution, and then we do our MLP. And it's sort of, we can think of it as feature extraction, where we are saying, look, there's a wheel here. And that means we should treat that differently. And instead of just using the pixel values, we now use where certain shapes and colors and all that are in the image. And we can have multiple layers of these convolutions to get higher level features or more abstract features, as we saw. So these can do a lot of different things right? for our data. We can uh, reduce the size of it. We can extract complex features. We can also increase the size. And we can also do a lot of funky stuff. But those are the primary purposes of it. And uh, actually, notably, in this image, I don't have a nonlinearity between the convolution layers or between the convolution and the fully connected. They should be there. Um, a little bit of a cramped of an image. But we do have a nonlinearity between them still. More or less, they are still just doing the same matrix multiplication operation, just in a more complex way. Cool. So now we have a new data set. So before we're using MNIST, which is these uh, handwritten digits, but what if we want to use another data set that is more complicated? This here is Safar 10, which is a companion data set almost, in the fact that it is nearly the same size. It's 32 by 32 instead of 28 by 28. And it has 10 classes, hence Safar 10. But it has color, very notably. So these images are no longer 28 by 28. They're not just arrays or matrices. They are 32 by 32 by 3, 
They have three color channels, RGB. So we need to be able to handle that. So implant that idea in the back of your head. We'll get to it. All right. That's another data set you should be pretty familiar with uh, later down the line. It's a very common vision data set to use. So let's talk about this more generally. We have some input. We'll say it's 32 by 32, like some particular data set. And we have some convolution, right? This is just a filter. This is the kernel that we had before. And let's say it's 4 by 4, all right? So what we want to do is we want to see these, and we want to be able to say what the output size will be. As you'd imagine, we need to know the output size if we want to attach a fully connected layer afterwards. Right? So we have our stride, which is how far we move the filter. Let's say the stride is 1. What should the output size of this be? Take a minute to think about it. Take a minute. <laughs> I told you it's algebra. <laughs> 28 by 28, I'm hearing a lot of. Not quite. <laughs> so I, I get where people are going with it. They're subtracting it. Um, the off by 1 comes from the fact that we have, uh, so if we start in the upper left, right, we'll be able to move it over one more time than that when we get to the end than just subtracting it. So we have both uh, this corner and this corner. Um, I assume that's where the error is coming from. Basically, it's not just how many uh, places we can fit it. Uh, anyway, so it's 29 by 29. You can just trust me. You can verify it yourself by trying it. Try with a smaller number if you want. Like try 5, for example. If it's size 5 by 5 and 4 by 4, we fit it once and then twice. So instead of just being uh, the subtraction, subtraction plus 1. All right, how about stride equals 2? I'm hearing a 30. 31. Anyone else? 15. I don't actually remember the answer. That could be right. Let's find out. It is. Nice. So think about if we're taking double the steps, it should be roughly halving the size of it. Clearly, it's not exact. So keep that in mind. Let's just give you an equation, though, and let's, let's look at it. So first thing to note here is that for this whole time, I've been talking about stride like it's a single value, right? We just move one at a time. That's actually not exactly the case. See, we could move it one per horizontal, but two per vertical. So we're going to treat each of these uh, dimensions independently. Is just to be thorough. <laughs> we can do this in the actual in the model, and it is totally possible. So let's talk about them independently. And what we get is that we have that output size. So in the case of horizontal, I have out h as the uh, output size. It's going to be input input size minus the kernel size divided by stride plus one. Cool. If you if you don't want to justify this to yourself, you really can just remember these. Eventually, it becomes natural. And likewise, when we're talking about vertical, exactly the same. I guess I had height and width. But when we're talking about the, the other dimension, it's exactly the same. Just that dimension size minus the kernel size divided by the stride in that dimension plus 1. And that's all. Great. Let's try it out. So let's say we have stride 5. All right, let's do it a little bit quicker now. All right, what would it be? Let's take a look. Let's do it out. We have this, right? So now, right, let's plug in the values. 32 minus 4 divided by 5. That is 28 divided by 5 plus 1 is 6.6. .6. OK. So sometimes it seems that we get, we, we get <laughs> rational values. Woo, we'll just deal with that. Except we have an actual integer size. We have a size of an array. We can't do that. So what if we really want stride 5 and we, we are not hearing anything about it? We don't want to change our stride. Yeah? We, we absolutely could, someone who already knows convolutions. Um, yeah, so uh, as he just spoiled, 
we can pad the image, right? So let's take a look at what that might look like. So we have our image right now, and it was 32 by 32, but now we're going to add a padding around the outside, and we're going to set it all to zero. Now, this image will now be 34 by 34 because we added one around the entire rim, right? So now um, we know that this is padding one. So one padding means adding all the way around the entire outside. You can actually do padding in one side instead of the other, same as the stride. But for now, we're going to say if we say padding equals one, that means one in both dimensions. Cool. Yeah. So now let's try it again. So let's say we want stride five. Then we do this, and we see that now it is a 32 plus two, right? So we've added padding one. So we see that we're adding that two times padding, right? Minus four divided by five plus one, and that gives us seven. Cool, integers. So now we've realized that by using padding, we can make certain strides work that wouldn't otherwise. But we still have to talk about that color. Remember what I told you to put that back in your mind? Now it's time. So we have our 32 by 32 uh, image, right? Wrong, it is 32 by 32 by three. So now we have a little box or a rectangular prism as 32 by 32 by three. So if we have that, what should we do to the convolution to make this work? Any ideas? You're not answering any more questions today. <laughs> Maybe later down. We'll see. Uh, Can you convert it to grayscale? Convert the image to grayscale. We could do that, but that's cheating. <laughs> We're not going to do that. We're going to leave it as color because we want the color. We want the color to be useful. Color is useful. If we see blue at the bottom, we think maybe it's the ocean. We care about that. Yeah. Oh, so <laughs> convert them into hexadecimal values instead of whatever they are. Um, so we can't necessarily do that, because imagine that each of the colors, instead of just being an integer, is actually a float value, which could happen. right? It, it's not going to be just images that we're using on a computer, but it could happen. Let's imagine data that isn't necessarily images. And in that case, then we can't combine them. We might be able to on uh, one of these, which could reasonably work. I don't actually know. Um, but it's essentially the same exact thing as an easier solution. So that is absolutely something we could do, but we could do you one better, which is we increase the dimensions of our kernel. So now the kernel is going to be three-dimensional too. So it's the same exact process, except now it's done going across an extra dimension. So we just move it the same way we did before, but now it's going to just move, it's just going to move along this 32 by 32. It's not going to move depth-wise, although we can do that. That was actually uh, similar to that idea. Um, and then just we're going to multiply everything along that third dimension. So everything that is there, we just multiply and add it together. Cool? And what would be the shape of this output, the output of this operation? Yeah? So 29 by 29 but not by three. Two-dimensional. So it would have one channel. Now we're going to call them channels from now on, the depth of it. The reason being is that each one of these steps, where we looked at each one of these pixels of the output, would just be the multiplication and summation of everything, every term lined up in the box. So it would still just be one term. We're adding up everything together that is, uh, that's overlapping with the kernel. So every single one of these is just going to be a single value, right? So you think in terms of depth, every single one of the, the um, values in the input will have a corresponding one in the kernel. Multiply them all and add them all together. So you only get a single value out of each one of the operations. Well, that's well and good, but now we don't have color in our output. What if we want that? Well, maybe we have a whole bunch of filters. <laughs> So now what's going to happen is we're going to have three channels in each of these convolutions, like we did before. But each one of these convolutions, or uh, so each one of these like that, 
but we'll have 10 of them total. You can count them if you don't believe me. I'll tell you later if it is. <laughs> and now what will happen, and it, does anyone want to guess what the output size of this would be? So now we're doing each one of these convolutions, we do exactly the same way. And now we're going to end up with some size, right? So it's 29 by 29 by something. What's it going to be? 10. Good, good job, everyone. <laughs> so the reason it's... <laughs> what was initiated? Uh, so, so it'll be 29 by 29 by 10. The reason being that each one of these convolutions are going to produce a 29 by 29 in image. You can call it an image if you want. And then we'll have 10 of them. So we just overlay them together. And now this output is 29 by 29 by 10. This is a case where our uh, convolution operation has increased the size of our input. You can see that 29 by 29 by 10 is bigger than 32 by 32 by 3. Interesting. So we have control over the, all of the dimensions, basically, by using a convolution. Not that that's particularly helpful, but we can transform them how we'd like. So, now let's say that we have our convolutional layer, and it's going to be three input channels and 10 output channels. And this is exactly the parameters that we use when we're initializing them in PyTorch, input channel, output channel. And let's say that then we're going to go through another convolutional layer. Now we'll have 10 input channels and five output channels. And then we have one that is five input channels by 11 output channels. All right, so what we're seeing is this is sort of working a little bit like what we had with the weight matrices, where it's going from one size to another size, and we're just controlling that by the input and the output. And just to uh, like get on here, what would be the uh, input channels to the next convolution if we had another one? 11, cool, we're getting, we're, we got it. <laughs> and what's uh, like, another thing you need to keep track of all this is you have this, and then you also have that each of these convolutional layers is also changing the dimensions of every single one of the, uh, the images as we go. So you have to keep track of both of those things at the same time. And that's more or less going to be the idea behind homework three, is you're going to make a network that uses these. All right? Cool. So here's our full image here. We have a convolution, convolution, then our MLP. And as I sort of just said, the dimensions that we're looking at in the convolutions can be pretty weird. You know, we could end up with something that is, um, you know, 10 by 25 by 25, where we start with a 32 by 32 by 3. And we need to then put that into our input. And in fact, it can also be batched. So if we feed in multiple at the same time, that's where we had in this past homework, we had an n by 800 input. Well, at this point now, we still have the batches, and the convolutions do not mess up the batches. They still stay the same. They're always at the front. And this will now be some n by 5 by 25 by 25. And we need to handle feeding that into some fully connected layer. So how would we do that? Give it a bit of time to think. Everyone, everyone talk, talk to your, your, your partners. Yeah, give it a couple minutes. I need a drink anyway.
All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to formalize the question. I'm going to formalize the question and say that the output of our convolutional layer, our second convolutional layer, is going to be an n by a by b by c matrix. What should be the input size for our first fully connected layer? So remember that we just want them to have, uh, we just want arrays for our weight matrices. We don't want high dimensional weight matrices. We could do that. And if you'd like to do that, feel free. Um, but it's not conventional, and it's not something that would be easy for you to program. So in that case, yeah. So, so uh, Rashira is saying that we have an n by a, then an a by b, and then a b by c um, fully connected layer. So we'd have three layers. We can actually do something better than that. And, and in fact, that would actually lose a lot of information, and we wouldn't be able to actually multiply them. But um, roughly, we get the idea that we, we care about the entirety of the input, right? So we have some big weight matrix that will have n times a times b times c elements in it. And we want to somehow feed them all in, <laughs> somehow. Right? And remember before, we had, you know, we had an n by a matrix, and that was perfectly fine. Um, and we were able to handle that the way with our weight matrices. So how might we handle this uh, behind you? <laughs> All right, all right. I, you, you, said, you said a word there that I really like for this answer, which is flatten out, right? And uh, your intuition to it, I, I think, works perfectly well for you and is like, perfectly good for like, this explanation, but I'll, I'll try to make it a little bit um, more broad, which is we are essentially just going to try to make it into a two-dimensional matrix. And what two-dimensional matrix would have the exact same number of parameters in it or the same number of elements in it? an n by a times b times c. So there is, with these matrices, a lot of natural ways that we can reshape them. Um, as Yuval was saying, we could sort of think of it as taking each one and putting them next to each other. And we think about doing that again. So we start with a four-dimensional matrix, and we're taking them out and laying them out. You think with a three-dimensional, we take each one of those frames and stack them together, and now all of a sudden we have a very long two-dimensional input. And essentially, this is exactly the same thing that we're doing here. We're going to generalize this to saying if we have any many dimensional thing, we can multiply everything besides the batch dimension. We always want to keep that uh, alone. We always don't want to touch that. And then we can feed it through. And now all of a sudden, we have an n by a. I mean, it's going to be a by b by c input. And we know how to handle that. We can use a fully connected layer just fine. But the trick here is that when we're actually making our neural network, we need to explicitly find that value. And we need to be able to create our network with that in mind, which means that you are going to have to, and we as a group have to, find out the output size of these convolutions. So this whole game of me telling you how to find the convolutions is not just some old school back in the day we had to do this thing like linear regression or perceptrons. This is something you're going to have to do for as long as you do machine learning until someone solves this. Um, you are going to have to calculate the output sizes. The reason being, if you try to infer the output size of it, or try to define what the output size is, there are so many hyperparameters that there are multiple ways for you to get the correct setting for that. So you need to actually calculate it, which is fun. <laughs> um, you can do it. You can do it using you could that equation. You could plug in, write it right in your code, and it will solve it for you. But you'll still have to do it. <laughs> so. Um, as I was sort of getting at, we need to flatten, and I use that word in particular because that is the actual method that we will use, is the dot flatten method for NumPy arrays, which will take all the dimensions besides the first and combine them into a single dimension. You can think of laying it out and stretching it out until it's a really long one-dimensional thing. Cool. Now it's a Kahoot. But, but, and I'm going to grab your attention right back, I, I've been thinking that the cahoots are not high stake enough. I don't know if anyone else has been feeling that. So we're not going stick. We're going carrot. I bought some prizes. We have a Kit Kat. Ooh. King size Kit Kat. It's not actually. It's a regular Kit Kat. A bag of high chews. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. Good stuff. 
and then a Charleston Chew. I never had one, but one of you will. First, put, first place gets first prize, second place, second choice, so on. Let's do it. It is. Now to clarify, to clarify, you can team up and share the prize, or you can earn the glory all on your own. Up to you. All right. I'm going to give it like uh, another 30 seconds or so, just in case. <laughs> Is there a team over there? <laughs> nice. Oh, nice, nice. All right. Let's do it. Oh, all right. All right, three, two, one. There we go. If you're not in, too bad. All right, let's start it out. First up, given input of this size and kernel of this size, which of the following stride values will cause an error? Stride equals 3, stride equals 8, stride equals 6, or stride equals 1. Are the question marks something to identify the right answer? Who knows? There's two right answers. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, pick whichever one I would have picked. <laughs> yeah. People have already pointed out that there's a wrong answer. There's two right answers, I mean, so, yeah. We can all, we can all make fun of me together in a few seconds. But pick whichever one you think I would have picked. <laughs> yeah, it's random chance now. Sorry. That's life. <laughs> All right, I think I picked six. Yeah, I picked six. <laughs> yeah, well, a bunch of people still picked three and, uh, and one. The uh, only, wrong, uh, only wrong answers were six and eight. The way you can justify this is that the, um, if we go back to here, if we subtract them, then we have a 32 minus four is 28. So as long as the stride is divisible by that, or 28 is divisible by the stride, then it will be totally fine. That's the only reason that we'd actually cause an error. Um, so I picked six because I think 28 is divided by eight, by eight is something. That, that's, yeah, that's on me. That's on me. I think that'll be the only one, but we'll get to find out together. All right. Oh, man. Okay. Well, uh, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. So, 
I guess, I guess maybe I wrote it with the other, other way in mind. Uh, OK, well, yeah, there were three right answers, and that was the one that everyone picked. Um, well, some people got lucky. They're going to get candy, and you don't. That's life. All right. Yeah, I know. Life lessons. All right. Using the same size input in kernel stride and stride 6, what padding value would cause it not to crash? Please tell me there aren't multiple answers. <laughs> This one only has one answer, I'm pretty sure now. <laughs> All right. And? Ooh, ooh. So, so I'm, I'm pretty sure I know what the people who said two were getting wrong. So if you look at this and we add a padding two, right, that means that we're adding two on each side, which would make it a 36 by 36. Either you didn't know that we're adding two on each side, or you were just dividing 36 by six and saying, that's good. But we still have to subtract. So we'd have 36 minus four which is only 32, and then we divide that by 6, and that doesn't work. But if we try 4, then we're adding 8, or we're adding 8 total, 40 each side. It was 40 minus 4 divided by 6 is 6. So that one would work. All right, cool. Let's see how it goes. EA Sports, <laughs> right in front of Cooper Cooper. Thank you. <laughs> Ooh, Gib Charles, <laughs> going for third place, I think. All right, true or false? We can always find a padding that will fix a sizing error given an input size, kernel size, and stride. What do you mean? Did I describe that as a possibility? Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. So. The image, the yeah, well, well, stop your groaning, stop your groaning, I'm right. All right. So if we look at this input image, this is actually meant as a hint. It's 31 by 31 instead of 32 by 32. The reason being, in this exact situation, we have 31 minus 4 is 27. And we need to divide it by some stride. Let's say we have an even stride, stride 2. So is there any padding we can add? So we need to add some number to this, to this numerator such that it will be divisible by 2 now. The problem being that we can only add integer paddings, and each of those paddings is added on each side. So any padding that we add will be even. You could manually add padding not like this, but that is not what I described. I described adding it on each side. So in that case, we wouldn't be able to. We need to pick a new stride. Cool. Or just get over the kernel size that we wanted to pick. All right, cool. Let's see. Ooh, Cooper Cooper coming down first. Gib Charlson, nice. All right, true or false? The number of output channels depends on the number of input channels. Nice, nice. People finally agree with me. Yes, so justification here is that if we have some um, output channel of like one of the earlier layers that has, let's say, five filters, that means that we have an output size of uh, five, so an input channel to the next layer of five, right? 
what we do is we have each one of our convolutions have those same dimensions. So it's by five. We apply that to each of those, or we, yeah, so we apply it to that one, right? However many times, and that is our output size. So the output channels are only dependent on the number of filters that we have. So in this case, we can see just from this image that the output channels from the first layer are eight or whatever, and then are five or whatever, I'm not gonna count, and then 10 or whatever, right? So we know that that is going to be the sizes. The input sizes we also do know in some of these cases, but they are not dependent on that. There are cases where they might be, say if we want to do a 3D convolution, but we're not doing that, so we're going to ignore that. All right, cool. Let's see, ooh, Cooper Cooper staying up there, nice. <laughs> Next, quiz. Imagine we have a convolution of this structure. What is the size of the output? Is it 32 by 32 by 3? with stride one, padding one, and kernel shape three by three. So it's a three by three. And there are going to be three channel inputs and 20 filters in the convolution. This is the kind of stuff you're gonna to have to do on the homework. Yeah. Uh, probably, yeah. <laughs> They're also going to be in the lecture videos, so. Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right. The scary algebra is done. Hey, and uh, it was still the majority answer. Yes, so the way that we can do this quickly for ourselves is firstly, we just look at the size of an individual one of the filters. So we have 32 by 32 and three by three. So we have 32 minus three is 29 divided by, or so we have padding two. So we have 32 plus two is 34 minus three is going to give us, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's going to give us, uh, it's going to give us 29, right? Or uh, it's 31, sorry, 31, my God. 31, and then we divide it by the stride, gives us 31 by 31 plus one is gonna be 32 by 32. And then we know that we're gonna have 20 of these filters, so it's just multiplied by 20. And we also see that that dimension comes first in this. Um, that will be the convention. So we'll have um, batch size, then number of filters, or like channel size, then the uh, size of the actual uh, thing. So we have for example, Safar, which is a 3 by 32 by 32, it will be a 3, 32, 32. Just to get you on board with the convention of how these shapes are going to be done. Anyway, cool. I think there's one last question. Let's see where the standings are. Cooper, 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 stand on top. Eggnog, though, coming to dethrone. All right. Quiz. If we attached a fully connected layer to the output of this network to classify 10 classes, what would be the dimensions of it? All right, let's see it. Ooh, nice. Yeah. So, remember that the convention for the weight matrices is input size, output size. So if we're trying to get 10 outputs, it will need to be uh, 10 output, right? So that should be the output size is 10. And as the input size, we want the entirety of the output of this. So this will be, as we said before, 
a 20 by 32, or yeah, 20 by 32 by 32. So if we flatten that, that will just become one single one-dimensional vector of 20 by 32 by 32. So that will be the input, and then it will go to 10 size output. You can also uh, do your first kind of game of counting the parameters of this. So if we look at this, the parameters in this sort of model will be 20 by 32 by 32 by 10. In that weight matrix, how many weights there need to be to do that is just going to be multiplying the input size and output size. So you see being able to reduce the size also reduces the number of parameters, which in turn reduces the number of uh, derivatives we need to find. So something to keep in mind. Anyway, so before the last question, Cooper Cooper's still on top, and Chicken Coop is up here too. Nice, nice. Let's see if anyone can, just, can dethrone Cooper Cooper on the last question. I don't remember what it is. Quiz. If all of our weights are initialized in 0, 1, so between 0 and 1, what would our output converge to as we added many fully connected layers? So if we have a model like this. Yeah, not related to convolutions, throwing in a trick question. It's not actually a trick question, different question. Imagine they're just numbers, if that helps you. <laughs> nice. All right, all right. Let's justify it. Let's justify it. So let's, let's, like I was saying before, just imagine them as numbers, and we're just doing multiplication. If we're multiplying a whole bunch of numbers together, and they're between 0 and 1, they must necessarily be decreasing every single multiplication we do. So the same is true of these uh, neural networks, because essentially all we're doing is multiplication and addition. So if we ended up having all the multiplications be less than, uh, less than 1, it's very likely, it's not guaranteed, but it's very, very likely that these will start to converge down, 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 until we get to uh, 0. It doesn't necessarily converge, but it most likely would. All right, something to keep in mind. At least some of the terms would. Um, I think the people who put green, I like. It's kind of right, but also it's wrong. <laughs> All right. So let's let's see let's see the final standings. It's more dramatic this time now that there's stakes, right? Maybe next time I'll fail whoever comes in last. No. <laughs> All right. In third place, we have Chris. Yay. Second place, we have Eggnog. And in first place, we have Cooper Cooper. Nice, nice, nice. And yeah, 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 yeah. Give Cooper Cooper a round of applause. All right, and as part of the added stakes, um, you three, these three, come up here and claim your prizes in front of everyone so you can gloat my, like a little bit. Nice, nice. Yeah. <laughs> Who's one? Who's one? <laughs> All right. I'm a Cooper Cooper. You're Cooper Cooper. Yeah. Take your prize, and make sure to gloat it. Make sure everyone can see you take it. Yep. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you are lesser than him. All right. <laughs> All right, yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah, you, you go ahead. You can take whichever one you want. All right. I don't really care. I've never had a Charleston, too. I've yeah, I'm curious what they taste like. It says vanilla flavored on it. Huh. All right. All right, cool, cool. Woohoo. All right. Back to the slides. Oh wait, yeah, that's it. Um, so today, I, today I, uh, I made it a little bit shorter. Um, one, because I overcompensated how I've been making them a little bit long. And two, because I want to take a little bit of a chance to talk to you guys about PyTorch. So homework three is going to be your next homework, which is where we're finally going to get to use PyTorch. So PyTorch is built off of what is called Autograd. And if you can't guess from its name, Autograd automatically calculates gradients. So this whole thing that we've been doing, I know I've mentioned this here, 
whole thing we've been doing of calculating these gradients by hand, who cares? <laughs> we don't have to do that anymore. Instead, with PyTorch, all we have to do is define our model. So we'll say, OK, let's do a fully connected layer and this nonlinearity, fully connected layer, this nonlinearity. We just define that. And then it will automatically calculate the der derivatives for us. Beautiful. I've been making you do all this, this work because it's important and it's good for you to know. Um, but starting now in the class, we don't need to do that anymore. Well, starting whenever you submit homework too, we don't need to do that anymore. Um, and we're going to be using PyTorch. PyTorch is built primarily off of modules. So the whole, the whole setup is modules, which will have both an initialization. So you'll initialize whatever parameters you want, and you'll initialize it using very simple lines. So if I wanted a linear layer, which is just a fully connected weight matrix that goes from size A to B, I would say neural network dot linear A, B. Done. If I wanted uh, like a convolution, I'd say neural network dot conv 2D, and I put in all the hyperparameters, done. So you initialize it there, and you make them uh, local variables. They're, they're all classes. And then you only need to define the initialization and the forward pass of the network. So you just need that, and then you'll need to take the forward pass, which will have some input. You go through the input, and you get whatever its output should be. In the case of our fully connected example, we have uh, Let's say homework two, where we have fully connected layer, nonlinearity, fully connected layer, nonlinearity. We would just, if we got input as an input to our, to our forward, we'd say first layer, input, equals output. Then second layer, output, equals the next output. So on until we get our return. So we just go through the layers, we get our output, and that's our model. <laughs> and that will then be able to use just as a model and we'll be able to automatically do the updating uh, by something called an optimizer. So that whole thing is going to be very pleasant for you guys. And homework two, I'll give you a, a very sneak peek um, of what we're, we're looking like at this. It's going to be a notebook. Yeah, these are the solutions, by the way. So get as much of an eyeful as you can. Try to record it if you want. Um, but we're going to be dealing with MNIST. Yeah, it's already recorded, you're right. <laughs> That's probably a bad call. Uh, oh, well. Eh. <laughs> hey. Some of it, <laughs> some of it might not be right, by the way, so. Um, anyway, anyway, as, as, a, as, a, as a good faith gesture and also accompanying me asking you to please not copy and paste, um, for homework two, if you are not done with homework two, which uh, to make you feel a little bit better at company, um, a number of people aren't, um, which is all right. You can take three late days, even on this one, which was extended. Um, homework three should be less of a hassle, but I still don't recommend you guys overlapping too much. It really can be uh, overwhelming. Um, but uh, as, a, as a show of good faith, um, for homework two, if you're not done with it yet, um, I will allow anyone to work with anyone else on it. Um, without any penalty. I think it's much more important that you guys understand how these things work and you're talking to someone to be able to figure that out than it is that you are able to do it totally on your own all the time. So um, if someone has already completed it or whatever, uh, feel free to extort other people to help them. Um, you know, try not to. But if, you're, if you are helping someone and you are already uh, done with the homework or something like that, just make sure to work people through the problem. Pretend you're me. Pretend you're trying to teach the person. Crazy, I know. Um, but I would recommend that. And you know, just so people are a little bit less stressed about homework too, if you know someone who's in that situation, you can do that. Um, if you do not have someone in that situation, still feel free to reach out on Piazza or anything up until you submit it. Um, I will still be active. I'm actually not going to be available, though, tonight. I'm going to a concert, because I forgot that I had class today. Um, <laughs> So I'm not going to be available. Uh, the TA Rushiv and the UCA Adam are both going to be active, though. Um, I asked them to, at least. Um, so feel free to message them, email them, bug the shit out of them. Um, other than that, I think that is class over. Get out of here.